But we're going to talk about abiding, and really I wanted, before we started into this chapter, and God gave me this, uh, I just ran across this, and this is a teaching that was done, not, not my message, but just this little illustration that I'll show here in a little bit. It was done by an evangelist that spent his life really just evangelizing to the world and trying to make the simplest illustration of what we believe in, what we stand on, what our faith is. And I ran across this a while ago, and I thought, Wow, that's really powerful. It's a simple way to illustrate the doctrine of faith, what we believe in, what the Word has to say about it, really, because it doesn't matter what we believe in. It really just matters what God has said, right? I mean, that's what we want to stand on. We want to stand on God's Word. So I watched this little illustration. It was just done on a piece of paper, and I thought, well, that's kind of neat, and it really brought a little bit of understanding to me. So I wanted to share this with you because I hope it brings a little bit more understanding and clarity to you. Um, and at the same time, I just kind of dressed it up a little bit. Um, Haley made the uh, emoji faces, Haley and Caitlin. So I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for them that they worked. So, you, so I'm not like a huge computer guy. So I probably would have spent days working on the computer. So I'm like, how can I illustrate this, Lord? And he's like, Go old, old school, you know, just get some cardboard and a pen and, and, and do it that way. And then Haley did some decorating for me, so, and, and Caitlin, so I'm grateful for that. But what do we, what do we abide in? Because this is what we're on. We're, this is what I felt like God spoke into me. And as I, I kind of been spending time in his word and, and, and going through all the different um, chapters and verses that talk about abiding. What do we abide in? Are we abiding in ourselves? Are we abiding in, in what the world has to say to abide in and chasing after them things? Or are we abiding in what God has to say? I spent some time last week talking about His Word and how important it is. His Word is valuable to us as believers. It's what He's left us with. He's left us with these promises. And it says in, in his word that in Christ Jesus, all the promises of God are yes and amen. Which is amazing. For the longest of time, if, if you study um, biblical history, the promises were for the seed of Abraham. They were for the Jews. They were for those who followed after the law. But what you come to see is something different. It's all of a sudden, it's all that, all them things are leading to a head, and that head is Jesus Christ. They're, prepa- they're preparing God's chosen people for the Messiah to come and to make all of these promises available to his children. And, and then Jesus himself says, I am the true vine. And he says later on in the abiding chapter that you are the, the branches. You are the branches, and you must abide in me. In the beginning, it says, I am the vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, the Father takes away. But every, every branch that bears fruit, the Father prunes that might bear more fruit. And it says, you, you, are, you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. So he speaks this, and, and, and for the longest of time, I've read that chapter, I don't know how many times, and there's so much power in, in John 8, but I've never really just spent a lot of time to ask myself, what does that really mean? And as I, I did, I started to, to discover some things. I told you a couple weeks ago when I announced that abiding was, and I said, I really don't have a good rhyme for it, and then Liz said, Tom's wife said to me, she goes, I got one, I got one after church. And she said, abide in your ride with Jesus. <laughs> and that's Liz. So she said, oh, she was so excited about speaking. I was hoping she was going to be here. But she said, abide in your ride with Jesus. And as I started to think about that, I kind of liked that. Because it speaks of control. And that's kind of what Jesus is talking about. You know, if we're, if, if, if we're driving or, or, or riding in a car, who is that person that's, that is controlling that vehicle? Do you, are you trying to grab onto the steering wheel? Or are you letting God direct your path? 
Because that's what God wants to do each day. As we wake up, we really just want to make ourselves available to him. And to say, okay, God, what do you want, where do you want me today? What do you want me to say? How can I share your love with others? Prepare me to be that vessel that you can use for your love to be demonstrated through me. And as we abide in him and look to him and are connected to him, because he doesn't want us to ever sever that, that connection, he'll start to, to present opportunities for us to share the goodness of his love, to share the gospel, to, to be able to comprehend these things even better because he is the truth. And we need that truth abiding within us. So we praise him for that. Romans 1.16, the apostle Paul says this. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For everyone who believes. So this, this demonstration that we'll be just jumping into here in a little bit is talking about this is the power of God. The story of the cross, the story of Christ Jesus coming to save and to redeem his children, that is the power of God. The power, it says. For all of those, and then it says, who believe. And challenge yourselves this week. What do you really believe in? What are you placing your trust in? Because God calls us to place our belief in him. And we do as as how we've been designed and created, we do place our trust in things. But what is that thing that you place your trust into? It says, for the Jew first and also the Greek, for the righteousness of God is being revealed from faith to faith. So he repeats himself again. So as we, we, we stand and we trust on him and we believe in him, he, he, he moves us from faith to faith. It's, like, it's almost like you're taking, walking a stairwell. And every time you just learn to trust and, and you learn to abide in him more, he continually just keeps you on that journey upwards, closer and closer to him. But that's, that's our responsibility to choose so often people that preach the gospel, you know, or, or, or talk about God, they, they, they leave that portion out. But that portion is super clear in the Bible. That our responsibility is to choose to believe, to choose to place our trust in, to, to place our life into him. And as we do that, God will lead us on a journey and continually move us closer and closer to him, abiding in him more and more. And it is a, it's a joyous journey. It's an incredible journey. That's why you can hear about David and all of them talking about the, the blessing and the, um, just the, the, wonderful, the wonderful experiences they have with God. But then, this is the, this is the neat thing is even when they say, oh, this God's so wonderful and God's so great, then they're, then they're also crying out for more of him because they know that God just continually fills them. And he's like, Lord, I just desire you. I desire you above all other things. And as they just respond to God and believe in him, then God is always faithful. And as, as the psalmist says, our cup, Will be found overflowing. I, I read this, um, and this is kind of where I got it from a little bit, is um, in John 6, if you want to turn to me. This is actually where I pulled the abiding out, where I felt the Lord spoke to me the most about using this word abiding. And if you go all the way to uh, 50, verse 56, if you have your Bible. But Jesus is, is doing something here. If, if, you, if you understand where we're at in, the, in, this, in this gospel, basically his people, he's got this huge following. And this could be like for the church too. And all these people are following Christ because of all these wonderful miracles that they're experiencing. He's He's fed the 5,000. He's done all these different things. And these people are understanding that this man is a miracle-working man. 
and he's got a huge following, and they think that he's going to be the one that's going to deliver them from Rome, deliver them from their persecution and, and the oppression that the Roman government has placed on their nation. So they're following him as, the, as their leader and their conqueror. And Jesus does something really interesting here. As you see in verse, then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat, my f- eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. People are like, what? Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up in the last days. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. It says, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the, living, or because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, He who eats this bread will live forever. And these people are like, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? This is a weird teaching. This is hard. It actually says that uh, they, they say this is, you know, it says, therefore many of the disciples, his disciples, when they heard this said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand this? Who can understand this? And as you see in uh, uh, verse 66, it says that, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. But Jesus was changing the the temple. He was saying, okay, I've taught you some things in the natural. I've given you natural blessings. I've fed fed you guys. Now we're going to change it over into the spiritual realm. Now I'm going to speak about the spiritual principles. And he was was referring to what he was going to do shortly after that, and that was laying down his life, laying down his, his body, letting it be nailed to the cross because he was going to be that sacrificial lamb that was spoken of by John the Baptist. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He says, this is the very purpose and why I came, was to, to bring you freedom, to separate you from the penalty of sin, And you must receive, you must believe in this this redemptive work that I have done through the cross. 1 Corinthians says that the, the message of the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing. So the world, and that's what we want to be, we want to, as Christians, we want popular, I want popular, I want to be the next, you know, popular, you know, whoever, you know, but... The gospel is is contrary to that. Jesus says, I don't want to follow you because it makes you popular. I don't want you to follow me, as in Jesus saying that to me, because it's going to make you popular. I want you to follow me because you love me, regardless of what the world says. Regardless if it looks wise or foolish, regardless of what it gives you, I want you because you want me. And that's what Jesus was saying. And this is what, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. There's a ton of notes that kind of lead up to that. But too often, and I find myself, too often I would be one of them disciples that would say, okay, God, what is in it for me? What do you have? What can you offer me now? Where is my benefit now for me to follow you? But not always is there an immediate benefit I hate to burst your Christian bubbles. But, I mean, honestly speaking, I want to be truthful to you guys. It's hard sometimes to follow Christ. It's hard to lay down your life. But the reward is, is, is far, far, far outweighs the cost. It far outweighs it. People like to take Christianity and package it up into a nice, pretty thing. And say, well, if you follow Jesus, you know, life's going to be grand and great. And your circumstances are going to just flow perfectly in your life. Your finances are going to be overflowing. And and for some cases, God does bless you in them areas. But not always. And that's not his promise. His promise looks far past them things. 
And if he knows that some of these, these immediate blessings are going to take away from your, your relationship with them, he's going to hold them back because he's more interested than you. He's more interested in having you than he is you having things. He wants to have your heart. He doesn't want things to have your heart. And that's what he's interested in doing. And that's what he was telling them disciples. I want you to want me. I want you to receive me. I want you to abide in my love. And you're going to see my love demonstrated before the world. It says that, you know, God proved his love. He says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's, that's the gospel. That's the, the Roman road of salvation that's written in, in Romans 5. That he demonstrated his love. And he said, I'm going to demonstrate this love. I'm going to prove my love. I'm going to prove the love of God over you by laying my life down. But you must believe. You must stand on it. No matter what the world says, you're a fool for believing this. The Greeks did. When Apostle Paul, that's why he was, he was in, in, um, in, in Greece, or in Greece at the time when he was going to the Corinthians. And he was... Um, Speaking this, and he says, that's why he said it's foolishness. I preach the gospel, is what he says. Nothing else. Christ and Christ crucified. Amen? Because that's the gospel. That's the love story in which God has chosen for our redemption, the redemptive work of Christ. So it says, um, so it goes on, and basically it says, receive the completed work, because I don't know if we have a banner up here, but basically Christ said on the cross that it is finished. The work has been completed. And you must abide in the completed work. Apostle Paul says in in Corinthians, or uh, Galatians, he says that I do not set aside the grace of God, for if the righteousness came through the law, then Christ died in vain. He also said later on, he goes, if if I preach circumcision, which he's talking about our works, the works of man, he says, if if I preach circumcision, then then persecution will, will, will ease up on me because that's what the Jews were trying to teach him, to follow the law. It can be... It can be, we can, we can accept your Christ. We can accept Jesus. We can understand that a little bit. He was a, a godly man, and he spoke really great principles. And he really did a, a, a tremendous thing by laying his life down for, for the sake of the, uh, you know, uh, the sake of the gospel. And we can understand that, but there still has to be some law mixed into that. Somewhere along the lines, it has to have something to do with me. In our works, in Christ, and, and Apostle Paul says in Galatians, he says, no. He says, if I start to preach circumcision, Christ will not profit me nothing. Nothing. So we have to protect ourselves. Because I love to depend on myself. I love for it to be about me. But the gospel of Christ is different. It isn't about me. It's about him. And that takes the pressure off, doesn't it? It's amazing. So this is, these are the doctrinal things that I wanted to share with you. This one, angry emoji. You've seen them. Everybody, most people hear text, but you know, it's a way for people to communicate what they're feeling. And this is the doctrine that says works. Okay, so if I remove this, works. And uh, just set that guy up there. So... This is works. And this is what a lot of the world says. Proverbs says this. He says that there's a, there's a way that seems right to man, but it leads to destruction or to death. The world's saying, hey, as long as you're good, as long as your good outweighs the bad, that God's, God's a merciful God. He'll forgive you. But there's something that took place. And when you're saying works, you're you're declaring something to God. And you know what you're saying to God when you're declaring works? This is what you're saying. We say the cross was unnecessary. God wasted his time. He didn't need to die. 
That's, that's, that's a scary thought. But that's what you're declaring when you're saying that my good works will earn my way into heaven. The second doctrine, and think about these things as we're, we're talking about them. The second doctrine is Christ plus works. And we see this in the church too often nowadays. And you see this, guess what, the, what, what Christ plus works leads to? It leads to frustration. It leads to depression. It leads to anxiety because we just can never measure up to Him. We can't. He lived the perfect life, and if we try to live as perfect as Christ did, we strive for that. We want to honor Him in that, but that doesn't earn our way. So, as we, we live in that doctrine, as sometimes we find ourselves, and we have to battle against that because the flesh is strong. The flesh wants to depend upon itself. It's about me. It's about what I can do. But when we believe this, we were saying this. We were saying this about the sacrifice that took place on the cross. We were saying that when Christ died, it was disappointing. It was disappointing to the Father. He didn't accept it. But we know this not to be true because what happened three days later We'll be celebrating that pretty soon. He rose from the dead, and that's why we see in... I don't know if that'll stay. My little emoji guy wants to jump off. He doesn't want to be part of this doctrine at all. That's what, that's what you saw like in Acts. They said, whoa. The Jews would say, we can, we can tolerate Jesus. We can tolerate His teachings. We can tolerate a lot about Him, but don't you dare... Don't you dare talk about his resurrection. Don't you dare because we know that God Almighty is affirming his doctrine of his salvation through him. They wanted to silence that. They paid the Roman soldiers large amounts of money to keep them quiet. They bribed people. Anything to do to discredit the resurrection of Christ because if if he was resurrected, because man knows we can't resurrect ourselves. Once we're dead, it's totally up to God. And what God did is he raised him from the dead three days. And God was showing that there was no disappointment whatsoever and that he has the power over the grave. And then the third, and this is what we abide in. This is what I want our church to abide in because this is what the Word says. I want this church to become a Word-filled church this year. I want us to be filled with the Word and what the Word has to say. Um, John uh, 8 talks about being set free, but it says just before that, and we talked about that last week, if you abide in my Word, then the Son will set you free. He is. It's, the Word is about Him. It's his story. So the doctrine, and this one is this where we become filled with the presence and the power and the love of God. And this one is the doctrine of Christ and Christ alone. And this is what the church needs to be proclaiming because that's what Apostle Paul said. I preach Christ and Christ crucified. It doesn't get no better than that. It doesn't get no better than that. That is what I abide in. That is what my message is. It can be foolishness to anybody that wants to choose it to be foolishness, but it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. And he says, and when we say that it's Christ only, we declare to the world, we declare to our neighbors, we declare to our family, we declare to our community. And it's faith. Because we can't, we're not depending upon ourselves anymore. We're depending, we, we're standing on the rock-solid ground, that firm foundation that Christ has done it all. It doesn't mean that we live as the world because we separate ourselves from the world. There's people out there that say, well, Jesus, and then they go about doing all sorts of wacky things. But you know what? And I've, I've come to find out. You ask them, who is Jesus? 
They won't, they won't declare that Jesus was divine. They'll say, well, he was a prophet. He's a neat guy. You know, he was, he's a way that, that was able to explain to us you know, a more of you know, a more of an understanding about our heavenly Father, but they 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 don't understand the concept that the divine God, the Trinitarian God, Jesus, the Son, the only begotten, the unique, as we learned about Christmas time, the unique Son of God, came down, shed His blood, died on the cross, rose again in three days, and was raised again, and the Father says it's sufficient, it is finished, it's complete. For those who place their trust in Him, the ho- those that, that believe in Him are secure. It's not about our works. They don't get us, they don't get us far. It's about Him and our relationship with Him. So this week as you... Just spend time in you just thinking about him, praying to him, worshiping him, cultivating this relationship with him, staying connected with him, abiding with him. I encourage you to stand upon the doctrine of Christ alone. Christ and Christ alone. Amen.